Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Hotep, which in the language of ancient Egypt means we come with justice in peace. Welcome to Freedom Now, a Saturday Pan-Africanist and International World Affairs program. Freedom Now is committed to the principle of the rights of all peoples and nations to self-determination. We thank you deeply for your contribution to KPFK, which permits programs like Freedom Now to stay on the air. In this era of corporate acquisition and co-optation of all dissident media, we provide the microphone challenging their corporate and racist point of view. So stay tuned for Agenda here at Freedom Now. Fellas, I'm ready to get up and do my thing. I want to get into it, man, you know. Ho tips and wisdom to all of our faithful and devoted listeners out there in the radio verse. This is Brother Brandon Sankara, and I want to start things off with a thank you to all of you listeners out there who continue to support Freedom Now. You keep us on our mission and allow us to bring you our agenda for today, Saturday, May 11th, 2024. We begin with our dear sister, Luyanda Kaboka, bringing us the African drumbeat historical calendar for the week, reminding us that every day is a day in African history. Then, author, historian, and professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston and Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn will be joined on the line by Thomas Guglielmo. Professor and Department Chair of American Studies at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. For our purposes today, he's the author of the book, Divisions, A New History of Racism and Resistance in America's World War II Military. This will be some historical knowledge that you will not want to miss. Then, in the second half of our program, Dr. Horn will be joined on the line by Felix Jane Lewis, Assistant Professor of History at the University of California at Irvine and author of the forthcoming book, Exporting the Revolution, Haitians in the Age of Global Blackness from 1890 to 1944. It's all right here, so stay tuned. Now I'm going to be on the ones and twos as we pour this knowledge, making sure your mental cup runneth over with revolutionary wisdom right here to quench your mental thirst on Freedom Now, KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, and KPFK.org streaming live on the web. To make sure that we stay on a smooth ride with that cultural vibe you know and love, we'll be enjoying a musical bottom featuring Zap Mama, Makan Dembele, Milt Jackson, Pharaoh Sanders, Cannonball Adderley, Horace Parlin, and Thelonious Monk. Now people get ready for this train of coming, taking you one step closer to mental liberation, and stay tuned for that beat of the historical drum, followed by an interview with Dr. Gerald Horn featuring Thomas Guglielmo.
néocolonialisme Le néocolonialisme Le sionisme L'apartheid Foster John Smith Begin Vive la révolution Vive le président Messe Couture Vive la révolution africaine Vive Hotep, this is Sister Luyanda Koboka with Freedom Now's African Drum Beat Historical Calendar for the week of May 9th. Our objective here is to instill the spirit of social struggle by standing on the shoulders of the heroes and sheroes of bygone generations that have smashed the capitalist systems of slavery, colonialism, segregation, and faced the challenges of neocolonialism today. May 9th, 1800s. John Brown, a European abolitionist, was born. John Brown died with two of his sons on a God-inspired mission to overthrow the slavetocracy of the United States at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. He mobilized African slaves under the banner of the Bible to slaughter plantation owners. May 9th, 1920. Celia Sanchez, the Eva Baron of Cuba, was born. She was a warrior. She created orphanages, organized the Marian Grajales Women's Military Platoons. She helped founded the Federation of Cuban Women. These programs empowered women as equals in the liberation of Cuba and its consolidation into a socialist state. May 10th, 1969, the South African student organization SASO was founded. SASO continued the global tradition of students becoming organized revolutionary intellectuals, a critical component in the building of liberation movements and revolutionary parties, providing cadre for the Pan-Africanist Congress and the African National Congress, as well as for Azapo. May 10th, 1930, United Farm Workers leader and co-founder Dolores Huerta was born. Ms. Huerta organized agricultural workers to demand better pay and working conditions in the face of mafia-controlled grave vineyards and state politicians in the fields of Central California. Dolores, together with Cesar Chavez and thousands of laborers, organized the most militant strikes in the 60s here in the United States. May 11, 1981, Bob Marley, pan-African reggae artist and advocate of African liberation and unity dies. Bob Marley, the most well-known Rastafarian artist, spread the teachings of African pride, unity and revolution throughout the world and swelled the ranks of the Rastafarian movement with our teachings of love, unity and black pride. May 12, 1928, Sam Jumo, president of SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, was born. SWAPO was a mass popular people's movement which successfully defeated the European Antelopers, backed by the racist United States and South African governments in the decolonization struggle of Namibia, located in Southern Africa. May 13, 1985, Wilson Good, the Negro mayor of Philadelphia, authorized the bombing of MOVE headquarters that destroyed 61 homes and killed several Africans. MOVE, an African communal movement stressing healthy living, African culture, and anti-capitalist values. May 13, 1551. The University of Mexico was founded, which was the first university to be created in North America. May 13, 1950. Steve Lynn Morris, Stevie Wonder, singer, composer, and activist was born. 
CV Wanda has done benefit concerts for the liberation movements in Southern Africa. He has organized and financed the national movement to make Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday and is the only African musician that owns his own radio station and has been producing consciously uplifting music for the last 40 years. May 14th, 1888. Slavery was abolished in Brazil and replaced by forced wage labor. Brazil, which has the largest African population in the Western Hemisphere, has maintained many African traditions from the pre-colonial period. This is Freedom Now at 90.7 FM in Southern California, 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara, and broadcasting live worldwide on the web at www.kpfk.org. To communicate with Freedom Now, please drop us an email at freedomnow at kpfk.org. As in our tradition, we would like to close out this section of our program with a unity chant of all power to the people. Amanda. Away to. Amanda. Away to. Amanda. Away to. For Pacifica Radio, KPFK Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn, and with me on the line is Thomas Guglielmo, Professor and Department Chair of American Studies at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and author of the book, Divisions, A New History of Racism and Resistance in America's World War II Military. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Guglielmo. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. So why did you write this book, Divisions? So, you know, I had long heard these popular narratives about the war bringing Americans together. I live in Washington, D.C., and I've long taught a class called World War II in History and Memory, and I take the class to the World War II Memorial uh, here in D.C., where um, you know millions of people visit every 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 year, and um, you know unity is always the the biggest one of the biggest takeaways, right? That this was this kind of moment of great peril for the United States, and the military helped to bring the whole country together and to rally everybody around this kind of common purpose of defeating the Axis, and um, you know based on what I kind of understood about the war, that never really made very much sense to me. And um, I also, uh, you know, finishing my first book about Italian immigrants in Chicago and race, I'd come across a bunch of amazing um, uh, federal records that, um, you know, offered an incredible view of, of kind of people's lives during the war. Um, and just also just lots of evidence of racial struggle and 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 division. And so um, I knew that World War II would just be this really kind of fascinating um, uh, moment to study. And and sure enough, yeah, the military, I argue, was not a place where there were moments of unity for sure. But the military as an institution was this kind of sprawling structure of white supremacy that was devoted to dividing service members along a whole range of, of lines, but most prominently between black folks and everybody else. So, um, but that's kind of where the, the project started. So with regard to that latter point, talk to us about black soldiers struggles during this war. Yeah, I mean, this to me is one of the really inspiring uh, aspects of this otherwise very depressing history. So, 
you know, I, I mentioned that I guess in order to understand the struggles, you just kind of have to understand the context in which those struggles were taking place. So the military was this deeply, deeply racist institution during World War II. There were some variations between, say, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines and whatnot. But basically, you know, if you were African-American, if you were defined as African-American by the U.S. government and you were inducted into the military on that basis, um, that would mean that you had a much more difficult time joining the military to begin with. And then that meant that you were going to be segregated into your own unit um, that was, um, you know, had enlisted personnel entirely of African descent, but that the leadership would be entirely white. You uh, were greatly restricted in the kinds of jobs you could have, greatly restricted in terms of the wages you could receive, uh, greatly restricted in terms of your recreational uh your space, your recreational spaces, both on post and off post um, from, you know, the United States to all all around the world. Um, it restricted your access to earning certain medals and decorations. It restricted your access to, you know, a fair shot in the military's criminal justice system. Um, it restricted your access to GI bills afterwards. It restricted your ability to get discharged on time honorably and as I said, with access to GI Bill benefits. So, you know, this was a, an institution, the U.S. military, that um, was just this uh, a colossal engine of inequity. Um, and, you know, and, and this was something that was uh, inequitable for lots of groups of color, but particularly for African-Americans. Um, they faced by far the most deeply institutionalized um, and kind of diabolical forms of, of, of injustice. And so in response to that, uh, they created this enormous um, uh, grassroots struggle to uproot Jim, what they call Jim Crow in uniform. And, you know, it was incredibly varied. So, um, you know, they uh, did everything from there were strikes, there were boycotts, there were sit-ins, there were marches. Um, you know, armed self-defense. Uh, there were folks who, you know, um, understood just how authoritarian the military was and therefore how dangerous any of this protest was. And so they, they um, instead chose protest tactics that were subtler and um, safer. Um, so maybe kind of letter writing on the side or foot dragging or um, you know, feigning illness or escape. There were, uh, you know, lots of attempts to just leave the military entirely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was this really, really powerful struggle that emerged throughout the war, um, primarily from service, you know, enlisted service members, though some officers were absolutely involved as well. And they were contesting uh, the way the military mistreated um, black soldiers left and right. Now, I could give you some specific examples if that would be uh, interesting. Well, since we have just a brief period of time and so much to cover, let me move on and ask you to describe the controversy surrounding the segregation of blood plasma. Sure. Yeah. So, so at the very beginning of World War II, there were these technological advances that allowed um, uh, allowed for the storage of blood and then the transportation of blood to battlefields. And so if someone were to get injured, they could get uh, a blood infusion and it could save their lives. Um, and so this technology was getting developed just as the war was getting going. Um, and so the U.S. government, uh, the Red Cross in particular, working in conjunction with the U.S. government, developed this nationwide program um, in order to collect blood from donors and then to have it on uh, on hand for injured service members on battlefronts all around the world. Um, and then it decided to just exclude African-American donors completely. Um, they allowed everybody else to donate blood with the exception of African-Americans. But, you know, protest was so uh, intense against that exclusion that ultimately pretty early in the war, early in 1942, so just after the U.S. gets involved, um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, 
Um, the Red Cross decide, again, in conjunction with the military, they're always working in conjunction with the military with regard to this program. They decide that African-Americans will in fact be included, but they will be segregated. Their blood will be marked and, and kept separate from the blood of everybody else. Um, and, and, you know, there are all kinds of rumors, I think well-founded rumors that these policies were actually not uh, carried out um, uh, completely um, in the field, you know, that when soldiers were dying in battle, they weren't actually checking the supposed racial designations of blood donors and things. But nonetheless, that was the established policy from the, from the more or less the start of America's involvement in the war to the very end. Now, if I heard you correctly, you said that the initial plan was to allow for blood from Native Americans, from the Chicano Latinx community, from Asian Americans, presumably Japanese Americans too, everybody except Black Americans. And I'm wondering, the proponents of that plan, what was their ostensible rationale? So they had a, a few different rationales. I mean, they kind of recognized that there were no scientific bases for these arguments. But what they often did was, you know, and I, to me, this was often a little bit of a dodge on their part, but they would often blame ordinary white people, you know, and they'd say, you know, ordinary white, we understand, of course, that there's no scientific validity to any kind of, um, you know, belief in a connection between race and blood. But, you know, white, many white people do believe this. And therefore, in order to kind of honor them and to respect their wishes, we need, and in a democracy, that's what we're supposed to do. They would often, you know, justify these policies with respect to America's democratic, supposed democratic values. But in any case, uh, they would often argue, listen, this is just something we have to do in order to ensure that this national blood donor program is successful. In other words, the idea was if we integrate blood, if we refuse to segregate blood and we just collect it from everybody and just, you know, mix it indiscriminately, um, then uh, white people will refuse to support the donor program and it could collapse. And this would be a real problem for the war effort. So that was often the argument they made. It was kind of a supposedly pragmatic uh, decision rather than one rooted in a kind of essentialist belief in race and blood difference. So I take it that none of the proponents of this plan said something to the effect that we're segregating black blood because this is payback for there being property that was expropriated without compensation in 1865, and therefore they need to be punished for all time as a result. No one actually said that, I take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, how does this intersect with the Pacific War, the war with Japan, because many in Tokyo saw themselves as fighting a so-called race war mm -hmm. and they were making appeals across the Pacific to those who were the victims of white supremacy. And yet you had black American soldiers who were crossing the Pacific to fight Tokyo, not to mention Asian Americans, Japanese Americans, Native Americans, etc. How did these two forces intersect? Well, they intersected in a whole range of complex ways. So I'll mention a few obvious ways first, and that is, you know, so because of with Japan, Japanese Americans were also the victims of all kinds of racist discrimination in the military. So, you know, initially they were, uh, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, they were being drafted into the military um, and, 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 uh, drafted into the military without any real discrimination. Um, this is after the Selective Training and Service Act is passed in 1940. So this is the first peacetime draft passed by the U.S. Congress. Um, Japanese Americans are being inducted into the military in fairly large numbers without any real discrimination. But then, you know, Pearl Harbor happens and um, all of a sudden there are these immense fears that Japanese Americans are really Japanese. They can't be trusted. This is the kind of distinct form of anti-Japanese racism that emerges. It's the idea that Japanese Americans are truly Japanese. They're never truly American and therefore they cannot be trusted and therefore they need to be barred from the military. And so for a time starting roughly in you know, March of 1942, Japanese Americans induction stops into the military. Um, 
The Navy never again accepts Japanese Americans for the entire war. So they are never included in the Navy from the beginning of the war to the end. The Army goes from total exclusion to eventually allowing Japanese Americans to enlist and then, in fact, drafting them into the military. Um, so they have a really complicated uh, set of experiences in the military because on the one hand, they are again seen as kind of um, akin to America's enemy and therefore always, you know, supposedly very, very dangerous and disloyal. Um, at the same time, there are other folks in the military who really believe in Japanese American soldiers, think they can actually be really good American soldiers, so long as they're very carefully screened and carefully surveilled. Um, and this gets to back to your question, you know, um, many of these military leaders understand, as you said, that Japan is is constantly questioning America's um, supposed war aims, constantly challenging America's, you know, um, uh, uh, rhetoric about being a kind of a, a, a beacon of democracy and that the war was really for four freedoms. Japan was saying that's ridiculous. If you look at American empire, if you look at, uh, you know, American racism um, in the military and outside of it, that's completely ridiculous. And so, you know, military leaders thought, well, let's see here. We can't really, they were very, un they were very reluctant to change any of their policies with regard to African Americans, but they tended to be more flexible, as it turns out, with regard to Japanese Americans. And so they ended up including Japanese Americans in the military and then and then in, in time integrating them into some white units, um, in part because they thought it would shore up alliances with quote unquote colored nations around the world, but that it would also undermine some of this uh, anti-American propaganda coming from Japan about how America was really fighting a war for white supremacy, not a war for the four freedoms. Now, what about the struggles during this period in the early 1940s, the struggles of those of Mexican ancestry and the Latinx community more generally in the United States? Sure. So, you know, um, in a nutshell, they have, they also have a kind of a complicated experience in the U.S. military because on the one hand, they're almost entirely defined as white um, and included in um, white units in the military. And that allows them um, a certain degree of, you know, opportunity to, you know, fight on battlefields with, with white folks and to kind of blur boundaries that were so prevalent um, in certain parts of the United States outside of the military. Um, you know, you had Juan Crow throughout Texas. You had places where, you know, Mexican-Americans are being disfranchised. You had rampant school segregation and so forth. So lots and lots of discrimination that uh, Mexican-Americans and other Latinx communities faced. Um, but in the military, um, they actually face more opportunities to kind of blend and to, to connect with, um, you know, to white, white people. And, and that sometimes created um, real bonds and real kind of moments of understanding and, um, you know, friendship. And so uh, at the same time, uh, I mentioned it's complicated. So on the one hand, there are these kind of increased opportunities for kind of uh, comradeship, um, training and, and fighting overseas. But on the other hand, you also see, you know, lots of examples, you know, tended to be less formal, less institutionalized, but lots of examples of racist treatment as well against, say, Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans, you know, um, uh, uh, again, not not nothing on the scale of what African Americans face, and 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 not even on the scale of what Japanese Americans face. But nonetheless, restrictions in their ability to get certain jobs, restrictions in their ability to get promoted, um, to become officers, um, that kind of thing. Finally, Professor, what about the original inhabitants of this continent? Speaking of the indigenous, the Native Americans. What was their experience during this war? Yeah, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, it was similar to the to the story I just outlined, really schematically, with regard to Chicanos and 
Chicanas, Mexican-Americans, and Puerto Ricans in that they too were, well, they weren't often defined as white, but they were included almost invariably in white units. And so that, again, created opportunities, especially overseas, to kind of blur boundaries. And so, you know, there are people in oral history saying, you know, this was the first time I ever felt um, like, uh, you know, my, my indigenous background was not some sort of hindrance to my uh, mobility or my opportunities or something. So there's that kind of story. Um, there is this kind of story that uh, boundaries blur, they break down a the military during the war, thanks to the fact that the U.S. military as a kind of a, as a as an institution did not impose segregation on Native Americans or did so very very rarely. Um, on the other hand, again, just as uh, you know, I mentioned with you know Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and other Latinx communities, there were also there were there were forms of you know less formal but nonetheless widespread examples of discrimination in the ranks, both from kind of top-down examples of military uh, officers mistreating people, but also mistreatment within the ranks, within, among enlisted personnel and, and, and so forth. So it's a complicated mix of things, both kind of increased opportunities in the military, but also um, some uh, kind of persistent uh, injustices. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Professor Guglielmo, Professor and Department Chair of American Studies at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., author of the book Divisions, A New History of Racism and Resistance in America's World War II Military. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Thank you. This is Sister Flora, and you are listening to Freedom Now at KPFK 90.7 FM in occupied Mexico, including Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, 93.7 FM in San Diego, and streaming live on the web at kpfk.org. Today's program, as well as 10 prior editions, can be reheard at kpfk.org slash audio archive, and scroll down to Freedom Now. From 12 to 1 p.m., following Freedom Now is her sister Asunta with Spotlight Africa addressing issues facing Mother Africa. For a truly alternative international perspective on world affairs, check out RTTV Russia, CCTV China, and online at Presna, Latina Cuba, Telesor, Venezuela. News 24, South Africa, and Press TV, Iran. We will now continue with historian professor Dr. Gerald Horn. Welcome back here to Freedom Now. We're going to keep this train of moving and send you back on over to Dr. Gerald Horn, who's now being joined on the line by Professor Felix Jean Lewis. Take it away, Dr. Horn. For KPFK Pacifica Radio Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn. And with me on the line is Felix Jean Louis, Assistant Professor of History at the University of California at Irvine and author of the forthcoming book, Exporting the Revolution, Haitians in the Age of Global Blackness, 1890 to 1944. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Jean-Louis. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. And we appreciate your joining us. So why are you writing this book? You know, so I am a, a Haitian historian by birth. My grandfather, uh, Felix Jean Louis the first and my grand my dad the second or both these lay Haitian historians uh, so I grew up uh, listening to the stories of the revolution and so my life's just sort of ushered me here um, and one of the reasons the book is called exporting the revolution is because uh, 
Without fail, every time I spoke to an elder about Haitian history, no matter what period, it inevitably came back to what you have to understand is, is during the revolution, this happened. And this was a sort of uh, the, the seed that emerges as Duvalier, as Aristide, as um, the occupation. All of these things always went back to the revolution. So the title is sort of a send up of that, but it's also a... Uh, uh, a, de a defining element of Haitian internationalism. Um, Haitians understood themselves as the, as the vanguard of the, the freedom movement for people of African descent in the Americas. And they took up that charge um, with, the, with the revolution. Um, you know, from Dessalines constitution that declared all black people on Haitian soil to be free uh, to Baron uh, de Vassy that wrote about anti-slavery tracts this was sort of Haiti taking the charge on uh, on the freedom of people of African descent who in the Americas in 18, beginning in 1804 and for most of the 19th century were enslaved. And the last thing I say, it also is my reflection on what the Haitian Revolution was. And this is how it jumps off into the internationalism. The Haitian Revolution was not just an uprising of the enslaved. It was that without question, but it was a, a diasporic moment you have to understand it as a disparate group of people of African descent who came together over what they, what we call the cleavages, the, the divides of diaspora to overthrow uh, colonialism and white supremacy. You have to imagine in the years leading to the revolution, about 200,000 or so of the 500,000 enslaved that rose up were had been brought in chains. Some of them were on opposite sides of civil wars. And some of this played out in the fighting, but in actuality, this is a diasporic moment similar to what happens in Harlem during the Renaissance, in Paris during the interwar years, in London. Um, and so this is really why I focus on exporting the revolution. So why is the starting point 1890? Well, 1890 is this guy who's often mentioned um, in conversations about pan-Africanism, but we have we have not appreciated the breadth of his work. And this is Benito Sylvain. Um, several works, Emmanuel Geis's uh, classic text on pan-Africanism, uh, Tony Martin's um, in, in the, I forget, it has the red cover, I'm forgetting the title of it, captures- Race his, First. Race First, right. Captures his speech at the Pan-African Congress um, at the at the end. Um, um, Brent Hayes Edwards, um, practice of diaspora mentions Benito Silvain on the first name, but we have no, we have, we haven't captured the breadth of a guy who really does a lot of the early work that traces the contours of Pan-Africanism, internationalism to come. So in 1890 in Paris, France, he founds this journal on this newspaper and it's, the title is La Fraternité, Les Intérêts d'Haïti et la Race Noire. And to translate that, it's the brotherhood the interests of Haiti and the black race. And in this text, he does a lot of what happens in the later sort of Pan-African newspapers. He, you know, what we call reciprocity, um, simultaneity, where we talk about the Guadalupians and the African-Americans and what and colonization is happening in Africa at the same time. In any particular edition of these newspapers, these things are presented side by side. Um, lynching in the United States, um, side by side, and he founds this newspaper in 1890. And this is really what, and he's in this moment, he marks a change from the black nationalism, um, what um, Nikoke talks about um, the cosmopolitanism, um, but he starts to look ab about uniting people of African descent um, in defense of blackness. And his career spans until his death in 1915, about six months or so before the US occupation of Haiti. But he's in contact with Booker T. Washington. He takes a trip um, to Ethiopia to meet Menelik the, uh, and enlists him in his program. This is why at the 1900 Pan-African Congress, he is both the representative of Haiti, the only international, the only independent black republic at the time, and an envoy of Ethi Abyssinia, the only uncolonized African country at the time. And then he goes on, he writes this, um, what is what I say is a precursor to Ami Cizel's uh, Discourses on Colonialism. He writes this dissertation, um, Etudes sur les, um, les colonies d'exploitation, a study on the colonies of exploitation 
um, which really traces the history of anti-blackness is what we would say now. He calls it race prejudice from uh, the, Ca the Caribbean uh, and the Americas through a uh, colonization of Africa. And he, he's in, you know, at 19, in 1900, he Du Bois is at the Pan-African Conference. Um, he travels to Harlem to preach to the AME on 137 to um, enlist people in this program, which is called the Relevement Social Den Earth, the Relevement Social Den Noir, um, I guess, organization of the social uplift of, of the blacks. And I know this word noir is a difficultly translated one, um, which is in a lot of ways a precursor of the UNIA. Um, and it, it really, it, what it does is it's a, designed to be this association that collects funds to send people, uh, uh, westernized people of African descent to Africa to participate in the uplift of the Africans. Now, who was Jacques Roman and what was his relationship to Mexico? Jacques Roman is a Haitian intellectual uh, um, writer um, and statesperson um, who this, the Vincent administration, who was the sui fascist president of Haiti beginning in 1930, um, who had actually jailed Jacques Roman in the early part of the 30s, exiled him. And when Roman returns, Seemed, shuttles him off to Mexico so that he's not a problem. Wormet, um was a Marxist. Um, Wormet, in his Marxism, had sort of sur surmounted the divide of Haiti between the elites of Port-au-Prince and the popular class. So he was a potential threat to um, Stenio Vincent. And so he shuttles him to Mexico, where he ends up uh, engaging with other ethnographists at uh, the, the University of Mexico. I don't have the exact uh, Mexican name, the name of the university itself. Now, his stellar work is the novel Masters of the Do. Yeah. What is that novel concern? Uh, the novel concerns a lot. So it is um, a Marxist analysis of what Cedric Robinson would call uh, in containing what Cedric Robinson would call the black radical tradition. It focuses on a call to the combit. And the combit is a practice of uh, the Haitian rural class that emerged out of deference to the capitalist wants of the Haitian elite, um, where it's a labor sharing practice, whereas in a community known as a laku, um, people in each of the, com of the community worked on each other's plots of land to ensure a good crop. And so in the novel, the protagonist, Manuel, um, calls on Haiti to return to these traditions um, in order for it to prosper. Now, here's the thing that I really want to say about this. Um, at the end of the novel, uh, Manuel dies. Spoiler alert. But at the end of the novel, the, the, he, uh, his project is to bring water to the fields because one of the driving elements of the novel is that Haiti's undergoing a, a drought, a severe drought. And he finds this water source and his plan is to make use the combi to bring the water to, to the land. And at the end of the novel, he dies. But the project is realized by two women, his mother and his love interest. And what is very interesting about this is that today there's a canal project in Haiti that's drawing water from the what's known as the Massacre River to uh, irrigate the lands of Haiti, and it's also being led by two women. So it's sort of a prophetic, and it's a combi project, and it's a prophetic, um, a prophetic sort of um, call, right? And, and Jacques Wemmer, in my analysis of his work, has a lot of critiques of gender, of Haitian masculinity. You know, I think if you read his work, um, there's a he does um, he does a lot of binary, uh, what is it, dialecticals. Um, sort of to realize his arguments. And one of the dialecticals um, involves gender. Um, some One of the underappreciated parts of his novels um, uh, and his short stories is, is a critique of masculinity, both elite um, urban masculinity and rural peasant masculinity. And so um, this is no surprise for me why it ends, the novel ends this way. So who is Antonor Furman and why is he considered a founder of Pan-Africanism? Yeah, Antonor Furman is a great Haitian intellectual statesman, um, sort of usurper. He's, he's sort of involved with a lot of hate things in Haitian politics, but he has uh, this uh, great work called the Legali De Legalité de la Race Humaine, um, of the equality of the, race, uh, the human races, 
which was a direct response to Arthur Gobineau's work, um, The Inegalité de la Sumer, The Inequality of the Human Races, that was written in the Med, um, French, he's a French uh, ethnographer or anthropologist, positivist, um, who really writes about the inequality of the races. And Fairman's masterful work um, uh, really is an intellectual um, undermining of that. Um, and he goes forth and sort of um, shows how these um, positions that these um, ethnographers, uh, uh, anthropologists have taken are flawed and, um, and based on racism. Just to connect it back to Benino Sylvain, uh, Antenor Fremet publishes regularly in La Fraternité uh, excerpts of, his, uh, of this book. Um, sort of to get a public engagement. Now, in 1894, actually, Benito Sylvain um, suggests um, a conference of people, of intellectuals, to intellectualize the what Du Bois would later call the color line. And Antenor Fermin was part of this conversation. He publishes the the um, the letters exchanged between the two of them. And these letters, Tony Williams even suggests the same, this initiative actually became um, the, the 1900 Pan-African Congress. Uh, Sylvain was also connect connected to uh, Sylvester Williams, who really was the chair of that conference in 19 in 1900. So these are the connections of Fermat to uh, uh, Pan-Africanism. But really, for me, I put the emphasis on, on uh, Benito Sylvain. Now, you mentioned a moment or two ago, Marcus Garvey. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. on his role with these Haitian intellectuals? Yeah, so in my work, I argue that Haitian intellectuals were really the driving force um, behind several of the main initiatives or realizing several of the main initiatives of of Garveyism. Um, so the, the what I would say is sort of middle managing the UNIA is what I would call it. Um, so one of the major first Haitians that come is um, uh, Eliza Cadet, who moves to Pennsylvania, finds out about the UNIA, um, and ends up being part of a uh, contingent to go to 1919, Pan uh, 1919 Paris Peace Conferences. And so what happens is is that um, uh, Philip Randolph and um, and what's her name? Ida B. Wells could not go. The United States denies them a passport. So Eliza Cadet heads out and he's in Paris and he runs into the Liberian um, president and gives him copies of the UN of the, the Negro world and says, you need to participate in this organization. And this is how Liberia sort of emerges. And so who does Garvey send next to follow up on this is Ellie Garcia, who is of Haitian descent, a uh, Brenda Gale Plummer, uh, in the article has said Elliot Garcia's the has been overlooked as a Haitian in the UNIA because of his Spanish surname. Um, but in fact, the level of his work um, in the UNIA has been overlooked. So Ellie Garcia may have been the second most powerful person in the UNIA. He was the auditor general of the association and the head of the Black Star Line uh, in, in a moment. Um, so you know, he this maybe uh, O.M. Thompson is another person that may rival him for power. Of course, Garvey is the, always the, the the star of the show. But Garcia goes to Liberia and the and, and comes back with a positive feel for the for the for the country and has Liberians excited about the UNIA. Now he writes two letters. One, the positive uh, potentials of Liberia, and he's doing his due, due diligence, and he writes a second letter for Garvey about the negative elements of Liberia, right? You got to do your job. And so um, I forget who the guy was who was the spy who really uh, foils the UNIA, but he leaks this letter and the Liberians get it. And Liberia dies in the UNIA story, you know? But if it was up to Garcia, um, the Phyllis Wheatley would have been either secured or at least it would not have been advertised as a secured ship. Gar uh, Garcia is always one step behind the people who are undermining Garvey. He gets to Virginia to, um, what is it called, incorporate uh, a certain things. An FBI agent tells him that this, um, some they're looking at Gar, they're looking at Garvey, and had he come to Virginia, he would have been arrested. So there's a he's he is really Garley Garvey's aide. And then when Garvey goes to trial, he tries to throw Garcia under the bus. And Garcia, the true, I I argue of the true um, supporter of Garvey, um, does not 
because he knows where the bones are hidden, um, does not throw Garvey under the bus and goes with him to stands with him to trial to the very end. And he's the only one that remains. But there are others um, in 20, 23, 24, as the UNIA is sort of um, chafing with African-Americans uh, and they start looking internationally. He calls on Jean-Joseph Adam um, to be his representative to, in France. And Jean-Joseph Adam is an interesting guy who I'm trying to run him down, but he attended Tuskegee, ends up in San Francisco as a, a member of the NCAA, NAACP, leaves the NAACP because he feels that they're, uh, they're too soft on Haiti and joins the UNIA. And, you know, in this moment, Garvey's having problems with people of certain phenotypical appearance. And um, in the Negro world, he writes of Jean-Joseph Adams, who, according to this, like, what is it called? The blazon from Shakespeare is this, like, mass of a powerful man um, that he becomes his envoy. And he connects um, the UNIA to the, the the French movements. He writes in Le Continent, which was a, a pan-black newspaper that emerged, I think, in 1924. He writes a couple uh, newspaper articles about the UNIA there and ultimately and i'm just uncovering this as i'm tracking him down he ends up um, teaching romance languages at the hbcu allen in south carolina um hmm. so this is where that's that's the, the trail is there now and i'm hunting it down you know being a historian is being part detective part intellectual <laughs> i understand you alluded to jacques roman and his relationship with the communist party yeah. Could you elaborate on the role of the Communist International in your story? Yeah, so Jacques Romain was arrested um, in 1933 or 34, something like that, um, with uh, the Negro, not the Negro World, um, uh, what is the name of the newspaper, but one of the radical black newspapers emerging from, uh, from, uh, from Paris. Um, and so the Communist International, Lenin had forwarded the, ne the Negro question. Um, and really, the, in Paris, a lot of the, the, the black um, radicals had really, the, well, black anti, the black anti-colonial activists had really latched on to Marxism after 22. And after the First World War is really when the, the, the mouvement noir uh, really emerges in Paris, and Haitians were central to this. So there's Lamine Senghor, who ends up at the 1927 um, uh, anti League of Anti-Imperialists, uh, where they forward uh, the quest, engage the question noir, the black question. And there's a Haitian, Camille Saint Jacques, who's in this conversation, who's a confidant and collaborator of um, Lamine Senghor. And going forward, there's people like Jean Bawo, the Haitian, uh, Ludovic, uh, Ludovic, I have his name written here, uh, Ludovic Lancome, who's also part of these radical black um, organizations uh, tied to Kuyate, who emerges in the 1930s, 1927-28, after Lamine Senghor as a um, as a leader of radical blackness. He's tied to George Padmore. Kamid Sedjak is also tied to George Padmore. When he comes to Paris, he meets all of these people, and they're all connected. And so Jacques Wame gets exiled from Haiti after he's arrested. Um, he's imprisoned for a number of years and exiled. He goes to Belgium for a little bit and ends up in Paris. And he ends up in these uh, com in these groups, um, these Marxist groups, sort of the in the end of the Marxist movement and the emergence of the Negritude movement. And he's sitting in a in a meeting with uh, Leo Damas um, of one of these Marxist groups. Um, so he's connecting all of this uh, together. Um, and if you look, so I have this uh, this book by uh, Leon Hoffman um, that collects all of Jacques, or a large number of Jacquemin's writings. And he's a Marxist. He's a sort of a classic, uh, like Karl Marxist. You know, he's he's studied Marx. He he had studied in us uh, in Switzerland um, in his youth. So I think he was very familiar with the German intellectuals. He's also um, a fan of Nietzsche. Nietzsche. I won't say appears um, as much as Marx, but he really loves Nietzsche. Um, and that's an avenue I'm also pursuing, you know, so many avenues. Yeah. You, you have us excited. So tell us when we can expect this work to emerge. Right. So this is the, the, the bane of my existence. I am working. Um, the, the first draft is due to the publishers this time next year. Um, I'm working on my chapter on Benito Silvain. I'm going to revise two chapters this summer. 
And um, in the fall and uh, and the winter of 24 to 25, I'm going to work on the chapters about uh, the about Black Paris and the Haitian involvement in that. So the first draft is due in March of 25 um, and should be ready by then. Finally, Professor Jean-Louis, author of the forthcoming book, Exporting the Revolution, Haitians in the Age of Global Blackness, 1890 to 1944, would you recommend undergraduate and graduate students coming to UC Irvine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to give a big shout out to my department. Um, I am in a in a great history department who are people who are great scholars on the one end and on the other end who are really committed to undergraduate and graduate success. Um, we have increasing uh, our increasing presence of sort of faculty who study people of African descent. Um, we are in the legacy of Winston James. Um, we have Jessica Millward, who's our senior um, faculty of studying African descent. There's Rasul Miller, there's myself, um, and uh, in more and more people who are studying. And um, I th we really are trying to put a Black uh, diaspora program uh, together in, in, in the history program at the very least. And um, yeah, we're excited about it. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, Professor Jean-Louis, Assistant Professor of History at UC Irvine, author of the forthcoming book, Exporting the Revolution. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Ditto. In closing, we'd like to thank our guests, starting with Thomas Guglielmo from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Find a Black-owned bookstore near you and get his book, Divisions, A New History of Racism and Resistance in America's World War II Military. Next up, we thank Felix Jean Lewis from the University of California at Irvine. Please be sure to keep an eye out for his forthcoming book, Exporting the Revolution, Haitians in the Age of Global Blackness from 1890 to 1944. Shout out to Dr. Gerald Horn for doing what he does best and guiding this train of mental liberation towards Pan-African enlightenment for yet another Saturday. Hit up your favorite bookstore right now and find one of Dr. Horn's many informative texts to enrich your library and your mind. Word to producer sister Tej. Much love to our sister Luyanda Kaboka for giving us the African drum beat historic calendar for the week. Much love to our spiritual backbone, ancestor, and Freedom Now founder, Baba Didan Kamathi. Abundant thanks to our marvelous engineer, and last but certainly not least, thanks to all of you loyal listeners and supporters out there. It takes a village to build a revolution, and Freedom Now is a village to be reckoned with. This has been Brother Brandon Sankara, and you can join us on Facebook at Freedom Now Gerald Horn. You can email the program at freedomnow at kpfk.org. You can also go online to our audio archives at kpfk.org. Scroll down to find Freedom Now, and you'll be able to hear this program as well as 60 days worth of prior programming here at KPFK 90.7 FM. We now send you off to our sister Assumpta with Spotlight Africa coming up next, addressing issues facing Mama Africa. And until next Saturday, here at Freedom Now, we stand running our marathon, ready for revolution. <laughs>